58 of the podcast in Swimming America, the Tour Sports Podcast. It is Monday, March 18th, 2024, people. And yes, we have a bracket. So here is the deal. This today, it is something, okay? So I was in Vegas uh, the last week, okay? Uh, I come back, I plan on doing a show, Sunday night reaction show, all that good stuff. And then a funny thing happens. Not going to lie, just be blunt, uh, I came down with something in Vegas. Bottom line, not like that, not like that. The bottom line, though, is that basically the way that I see it is that I was very much like an NC State in Oregon. I had to play five games in five days. I did five shows in five days. And so all of a sudden, I come, come home on Sunday. I do the Fox Sports Bracket Reaction Show, and I just had to crash. So we are back today. This is the Monday episode uh, we're going to, again, back from Vegas. The mics aren't quite working right. The lighting isn't quite right. But we got a bracket, and we got to talk about it all. So what we're going to do today is the following. I'm going to share my thoughts on the bracket overall, because I thought the committee had about as bad of a day as I can ever remember having it. And then we'll go bracket by bracket, region by region. I'm just going to give you some quick thoughts. Today is not the day that I'm going to give you every single pick for every single game. Because the bottom line is we still have to wait for some stuff. Uh, we have to wait to see the health of Tyler Kolick for Marquette, the health of Juwan Roberts for Houston, the health, by the way, of two key players for Texas Tech who Kentucky could be facing in the second round of the NCAA tournament. So today we'll react to what I thought was a debacle of a day from the committee. We'll have some early thoughts. I think tomorrow night, Tuesday, we will make our official bracket pick. So it'll be in your podcast feeds on Wednesday. And again, I appreciate all of your patience as we're working through some technical stuff right now. But by, I think, Monday night, when we start to do our transfer heavy stuff, uh, the lighting will be better, the sound will be better, all that good stuff. By the way, as always, if you have any questions for the show, feel free to drop them in the comments section on YouTube. I will get to them as soon as I can. Before we get started, really quickly, do want to thank our partners, BetUS and BetUS Sportsbook. We've been working with them all March long. And as you get set to make your March Madness picks, make sure to use the BetUS, BetUS.com and the BetUS app, okay? Bottom line is they have the best deal going right now on the internet. How about this? Your first three deposits. Your first three deposits, you get a 125% deposit bonus courtesy of BetUS Sportsbook. Your first three deposits, 125%. So thank you to BetUS. We appreciate their support, and we appreciate them being one of our partners this March Madness. By the way, I will have updates on the Aaron Torres Pod Bracket Challenge as well, working through some stuff with BracketFanatics.com, but we have a $1,000 prize pool. We'll have more updates on that throughout the week. With that said, it is Monday, the day after Selection Sunday, and that we do have a bracket. So let's not waste any more time. Let's get to the topic of the day. And the topic of the day, listen, I want to go region by region, section by section, talk a little bit about everything here momentarily. But you got to give me 10 minutes to get off my chest the debacle that was the bracket reveal on Sunday as I thought this was the worst bracket that I have ever seen, and I just got a, I got a lot to talk about, okay? And a couple of things. One, I tell you all the time, I'm not a bracket expert. Joe Lenardi is, Jerry Palm is, whoever you like in your bracket, whatever. Those are the bracketology experts. But at the same time, when everything the committee does is off from Joe Lenardi, off from Jerry Palm, nothing is even close it's hard for me to sit there and say that they did a good job. And by the way, I'm usually the guy, I may have a gripe or two. A couple years ago, Tennessee should have been a two seed. They end up on the three line. But for the most part, I'm not the guy that comes on my Monday show and complains about the bracket. But the bottom line is this was awful. You know when I knew it was going to be bad? And you're going to laugh when I say this. I knew it was going to be bad. With the second game revealed, okay, so first game revealed, it is the uh, it is the UConn-Stetson game. No major issues with that one. UConn, the number one overall seed. But you get to Florida Atlantic Northwestern on the 8-9 line. You think about the fact that Florida Atlantic, if you really paid attention, 
after they lost their conference tournament semifinal on Saturday, you started to hear the bracket experts say, you know, they might be a little closer to the bubble. They might be a little bit closer to the outside of the bubble and outside of the tournament than a lot of people were letting on. When they got on the eight line, that's when I said, huh, something's not quite right here. And I'll be blunt. It was kind of like one of those days, you know, like when you wake up and your alarm doesn't go off or your phone doesn't charge. You're just like, I think this is going to be one of those kind of days. That's what I felt like the second the bracket got revealed. And that is exactly what it felt like once the official bracket was out. Because this was, again, I just have so many gripes. I want to get into them really quick. First of all, the fact that the Big East has three teams is an embarrassment. Okay. And it's not because I'm a UConn guy. It's not because whatever but it just doesn't make any sense on any level. Let's just think about it at the most basic level, okay? UConn's the number one overall seed. Marquette is a two, Creighton is a three. So the committee believes those are three of the 12 best teams in college basketball. Well, where do you think they built their resume? By beating the likes of Seton Hall, of of St. John's, of Villanova, of Providence. And I'm not saying that all of those teams should have gotten in, But you mean to tell me that there were only three teams that got in from the Big East when, oh, by the way, Ken Palm had it as its second-ranked conference. I believe the Net had them as their third-ranked conference. It makes no sense. Now, I know part of it has to do with the fact that we had all these bid stealers, okay? I get that for people who don't follow this on a day-to-day, minute-to-minute basis, my guess is if you're watching this show, you probably do. But we had five teams that the committee says would not have been in the bracket if they had not win their, won their conference tournaments, uh, NC State in the ACC, Oregon in the Pac-12, Duquesne in the A-10, UAB in the AAC, and New Mexico in the Mountain West. So I get the idea that those are five bids. By the way, Mexico should have been in. That's another conversation we're going to get to in a minute. I get that there are five teams that should have been, that would not have been in that got in. And that means that there are five teams that got left out. But the idea that nobody raised their hand in that room, Nobody said, wait a second, we've all agreed all year that the ACC is inferior to the Big Ten, or Big East, and the ACC is about to get, what, four teams, five with NC State? They're about to get five. The Pac-12 is about to get four with Oregon, three uh, at-large bids. Nobody stood up in the room and said, that doesn't really sound right. And I'll be blunt, I know that Seton Hall was the first team out in the Big East, second team out overall behind Oklahoma. But I'll take it a step further. I think it was pretty obvious that St. John should have been in this field. And listen, I know that last 10 games does not matter in the the committee's eyes. I get that. That is a decision they made about four or five years ago. They said, you know what? We are not going to use that as a metric anymore because we don't want teams to kind of uh, choose not to schedule a lot of conference. But if you watch St. John's, I don't know how you could watch St. John's against UConn. Remember, UConn at MSG. They beat Xavier by darn near 30. They beat Marquette in the title game by 20. St. John's was a bucket or two for making that again. They they lose by five. You cannot tell me St. John's was not one of the five best teams. So my first gripe is with the Big East. It makes no sense. How do they only have three? I thought you had to find a spot for St. John's. Number two gripe, the Mountain West. I think you could literally argue Mountain West got six teams in. Five of them were completely misseeded. And again, all you had to do was watch the selection show. I was on air on Fox Sports Radio. And you sit there and say, something doesn't feel quite right about this, okay? So first off, we get the first four games. The two games in day in featuring at-large uh, candidates. Colorado State and Boise are both in. Now, Colorado State was a little bit closer to that line, but I don't think they were planning on getting, expecting to be there. But let's take it a step further. Boise State, in no bracketology anywhere, was on that 10 line, was in that play-in game. I saw, you know, listen, they had their their watch party, and that watch party looked more, st- like, like, like you might as well just left them out because they looked more stunned that they were in that Dayton game than anything else. So you have those two teams. Let me say this. New Mexico, as an 11 seed, indicates that if they had not won their conference tournament, they would not have gotten in. Well, that's funny, because if you asked any bracketologist, any expert, basically after they got to the semis of the Mountain West, 
Many believe that they were in that tournament, in the NCAA tournament, as an at-large. They beat Colorado State in the semis. And you think once they get to the final, they don't have to win there. So credit to Richard Patino because if they don't win that game, there is a very good chance. As a matter of fact, there is a certain chance that they are not in that tournament. And then you go through the rest of the conference. Nevada, projected by virtually everybody, virtually everybody as a seven seed, they end up on the 10 line. Now, I saw Steve Alford basically said, look, in the grand scheme of things, we would rather be a, uh, we would rather be a, uh, we would rather be whatever we were, a 10 in Salt Lake City or wherever they ended up than a, um, than a seven across the country in Charlotte or wherever. It doesn't change the fact that just because you're closer to home doesn't mean it was misseeded. And then Utah State as an eight seed, they got to play Purdue in the second round. So an embarrassing day for the committee with the Mountain West. I thought it was terrible. I thought it was abominable. That was gripe number two. Gripe number three, the whole bubble was just a disaster, okay? I already mentioned Florida Atlantic. Florida Atlantic, I'm not going to go game by game. But you start to look at some of the things on their resume. A couple really bad losses. I didn't think they were going to be in. I thought at least they were going to be in the first four. No, they're an eight seed, which means that losing in their conference tournament meant nothing. And listen, I'm not the guy. I love conference tournaments. I hate that good teams get left out, but I love conference tournaments. I love that the auto bids get in. But the committee is telling us, forget what happens on Sunday. That's been a gripe for years from the SEC, from whoever, from John Calipari, from Rick Barnes, from Tennessee, from Kentucky that no matter what happens on Sunday, does it matter? Well, let's take it a step further. Apparently what happens on Saturday doesn't matter either. Florida Atlantic as an eight is a joke. Michigan State as an eight with 14 losses is a joke. I don't care how many big games you play out of conference. If you lose essentially all of them, I'm sorry. You don't belong in the tournament. You had plenty of chances, plenty of bad wins, not enough good wins. Um, You know, you lose to Indiana on the last day of the regular season. You win one Big Ten tournament game. I'm fine if you beat Purdue in the conference tournament to put yourself in. But I just, I don't know. Another one, by the way, Texas A&M. I thought coming out of Friday after they beat Kentucky, I thought, okay, Texas A&M is in. Good stuff. Congrats to the Aggies. Then you saw the carnage on Saturday. You saw Oregon get in. You saw NC State get in. You saw New Mexico get in. And I sat there and said, That Texas A&M resume, I thought Texas A&M was going to be one of the teams that was screwed by the uh, bid stealers, right? Because Texas A&M, some great wins, some great wins to the credit of them. Two wins over Kentucky, a win over Tennessee at home, a neutral over Iowa State. They also have five quad three losses, five quad three losses, okay? This was a team that lost to Arkansas twice. This is a team that lost to Vanderbilt. I'm sorry, losing has to matter as much as winning. It, it, I get that they have great wins, but you can't have terrible losses too. I don't have as much of a gripe with them, but again, I thought they were going to be one, one of the ones that got screwed. I thought Virginia getting in was a joke. We all agreed all year the ACC stunk. Virginia did nothing late in the season to make us feel better. Now, if they had beaten NC State, if they get to the ACC title game, that's fine, but you lose to NC State. I'm sorry. This stuff has to matter again. At what point do the conference tournaments not matter at all? And if they don't matter at all, then we should just stop playing. And I love conference tournaments. I was at the Pac-12 Mountain West all weekend long. But if they're not going to matter, then why are we playing them? Why are we asking fans to spend thousands of dollars to go to these sites, to go to these events? It pisses me off. It drives me crazy. And then finally, my final gripe. You know, listen, I'm not saying this as a UConn fan. But I think, and by the way, as far as the bubble is concerned, I do think St. John should have been in Indiana state, a top 30 net team. Again, I think that sets the wrong message. When you put in a Michigan state on the nine line, when you put in a Florida Atlantic on the eight line for Atlantic basically has one great one all year at errors against Arizona on neutral. That's it. Finally, um, my last big gripe, and this is not me being a UConn home, but I didn't really break down the bracket until I got home later in the night. And one thing that it seems like everyone seems to agree on, UConn, as the number one overall seed, got the toughest draw in the tournament. You think I'm making it up. Just think about this. Iowa State, who many people thought should be the number one, the final number one seed in the West, they're the number two seed. 
So what you're basically saying is if UConn really is the top number one overall seed, then what you are saying is that Iowa State is the worst number two? Not I think they should be a one, but the worst number two? You got to be kidding me here. Uh, also, on top of that, you have the, the Big Ten champion, Illinois, as the three seed. You have the, all, the, the SEC champ, Auburn, as the four seed. Auburn, statistically, depending on what metric you look at, is like a top five to seven team in the country. And that is the four seed in the number one overall seeds region. Listen, we're going to go region by region. We're going to break it down. But I'm just here to say I just thought it was a disastrous day from the committee. And I'll be quick because I do want to get to some of the game stuff. But I do think two things stand out to me. One, I've said two things for years, and I think it's unquestionably true this year. First off, one, I do think you need someone besides ADs and conference commissioners in that room. Because at the end of the day, listen, being an AD is a tough enough job as it is, okay? You got a lot going on. Greg Byrne was on that committee. You think Greg Byrne, when he had to go negotiate Nate Oates' extension, was telling Nate Oates' his agent, hey, 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 buddy, can you give me about 10 minutes? I got to catch the end of this Boise State-Utah game. I'm on the selection committee. I think when he was flying to see Kalen DeBoer in late January to hire him as his next head coach, he was like, hey, you think we stopped by Washington State so I could check out the Cougars in person? No. And so to me, you need somebody. Listen, I know everybody likes to rag on Joe Lenardi. But, by the way, he was coming at me in my mentions on, on uh, Sunday, which was kind of crazy because I thought he was busy enough without, without me distracting. But I bring it up because get a Joe Lenardi, get a Jerry Palm, get somebody who watches all of these games, but then also understands the numbers and metrics behind it. I'm not saying put media in so Torres gets a spot because I've said I'm not a bracket expert. I don't crunch the numbers every day like Lenardi does, like Mike DeCourcy does, like Joe Len- uh, uh, Jerry Palm does. But you have to have somebody that sits there and says, wait a second now. Let's let's actually look at that Florida Atlantic resume a little closer. Let's look at that Michigan State resume a little bit closer. Are we sure we can't find a spot for Indiana State? I also think we need to take an hour after the Big Ten Championship for that exact same thing. If we're not going to bring in Joe Lenardi or Jerry Palm, let's at least have everybody sit up in that room and say, I want everybody. It's like kindergarten, right? Silent time. Take 10 minutes. I want you to look at this bracket and tell us what you think. Are we missing anything? Because there has to be a better way to do this. And I swear, I am not complaining about the bracket guy. But this was just an embarrassment on so many levels. I think so many teams got screwed. And remember, when you misseed a Utah State, all that does is hurt the team that they're playing in the first round. It hurts Purdue in the second round. When you misseed Iowa State, it hurts Illinois as the three seed. When you miss seed Auburn, it hurts UConn as the one seed. It hurts San Diego State as the five seed. So I could go on and on. It's disappointing, but I do actually want to talk a little bit of basketball. All right, let's get to some of the actual basketball. Crazy, I know, right? Like, it's like, what, whoa, we could actually talk some of these games here. And I do want to dive in. And what I want to do, I want to go region by region. Uh, with, with, with all these games. Because at the end of the day, look, um, you know, as I said to lead the show, if you're just joining me, totally get it. No, it's a busy Monday. You were hoping for Torres on Sunday night. Shame on me. Um, but I just bring it up because we are not going to do uh, our bracket picks just yet because at the end of the day, listen, there's still a lot of stuff that we got to figure out. One, we have to deal with the, uh, we have to deal with the uh, figuring out just in general um, what is going on with the, the first four games. So that's the first part. We've got to figure out who wins the first four games, et cetera. But beyond that, I think you got to look at injuries. What's the status of Tyler Kolick at Marquette? What's the status of Juwan Roberts at Houston? What's the status of a couple guys at Texas Tech? Because I think you have two of uh, Texas Tech's potentially three most important players might not be available for them in this NCAA tournament. But let's go ahead and dive in. And I just want to give quick thoughts on all the regions. Let's start with the East region. If you're watching on YouTube or if you don't, if you have a bracket in front of you, that is your top left region. That is the one, of course, with uh, UConn as the one seed. With on top of that, you also have as the two seed, we talked about Iowa State. The three seed is, uh, is Illinois. The four seed is Auburn. And when I look at that bracket, a couple things stand out. First of all, I know I just said it. 
But that is the bracket of death, right? We hit, When we do the, the World Cup every year, there's all, or every four years, I guess it is, there's always that, like, it's like Group C is the group of death. Well, the East is the bracket of death because it's so funny. Coming into this week, you thought about UConn potentially being a team that was going to go through Brooklyn and then Boston. They wouldn't have to get on a flight to go to the Final Four. That's great, but you got to go through the bracket of hell. And when I look at this bracket, Iowa State is the number two. Listen, I will say I don't think there was much of an argument for Iowa State as the final number one seed because they were one of those schools that whether you agree the Big 12 has manipulated the net or not, Iowa State had basically the worst out-of-conference strength of schedule of all the power conference teams. And so I do think if we are going to say the non-conference matters, and we do say it does because we don't use the last 10 as a metric, then we also have to acknowledge that you can't reward Iowa State for playing nobody in the out-of-conference. So I had no problem with them being not the final number one, but for them to be the top number two, the last number two in UConn's bracket, that's crazy. And what I will say, and I say this as a UConn guy, UConn got a heck of a draw and a tough draw. Because to me, when I look at UConn, what do I always say about UConn? How do you beat UConn? There's a couple ways. One, first of all, you have to match their toughness and intensity. I've watched so many UConn games this year where it's close for eight minutes, 12 minutes, 15 minutes, maybe even 25 minutes into the second half. And then they are just so relentless. They dive on the floor for every loose ball. They fight. You got guys like our buddy Hassan Diara, who will be joining us later in the week. Tristan Newton getting offensive rebounds, throwing elbows. And if you don't match that intensity for 40 minutes, you're not going to beat them. Well, what would you describe Iowa State as? Intense and mean. What would you describe Auburn as? Intense and mean. And so those are two teams that I think match up with UConn. Now, the other thing with UConn, which is important, one, you got to be good enough defensively to slow them down. Those are two very good defensive teams. Iowa State, number one, I believe, in field goal percentage defense after the Big 12 championship game. Auburn, top five, top 10 in Ken Palm defensive efficiency. So you have to be able to get stops. You also have to be able to go score for score, which is what worries me a little bit about both those teams. Both those teams are good, but not great three-point shooting teams. I mentioned it when UConn lost to Creighton. I said to beat UConn, what you have to do, you have to be great defensively. You have to have size down low to not get killed on the boards, and neither of those teams will by any stretch, you also have to be able to hit threes. And so I think that's the big thing for me. Iowa State about a 34 35% three-point shooting team. Same with Auburn. I think they probably got to shoot closer to 40% to beat UConn. But on one day, that can absolutely happen. I think both those teams are built nicely to beat UConn. If you're looking for a couple upsets in this bracket, you know, the one that really stands out to me, and I like Illinois, but this is a matchup-based tournament, and you can't look at what you thought was going to happen before we saw the bracket. You have to go matchup by matchup, second by second, minute by minute, and figure out, okay, how do these teams match up? And so Illinois is one of the most explosive offensive teams in college basketball. 74 points per game. We talked about them in the Big Ten tournament. We said they, they could put the ball in the basket with anybody. Terrence Shannon averaging 23 points per game. Uh, as a team, they are averaging like 84 points per game, four guys in double figures. Here's the issue, though. Moorhead State plays one of the slowest tempos in college basketball. They are elite defensively across the board. And so, yes, if Illinois gets up 22 to 6 in the first eight minutes, I don't know that Moorhead State will be able to come back. But I think Moorhead State's going to be able to dictate tempo. And I think because Illinois is a little iffy on defense, if Moorhead State can keep it close, it's going to be one of those games. The longer it goes, the less Illinois can run, the less tempo there is, the less they're able to put the ball in the basket. The more they tighten up, the more that crowd, I believe they're playing in Omaha, Nebraska, starts to root for the other team, starts to root. They all become at that point, obviously, uh, Moorhead State fans. So I don't know that I'm ready to pick it just yet, but I do not like that matchup for Illinois. I also think, by the way, BYU, if Moorhead State pulls off the upset, you could see BYU win back-to-back games. I think they match up well with Duquesne, and I think they would struggle with Illinois but could potentially beat Moorhead State. Other thoughts, you know, Washington State just being in the bracket is awesome. First time since 2008. 
Obviously, that was the second longest power conference uh, run of any team. out. So DePaul is the only power conference team that has been longer to the NCAA tournament before this year. Credit to Kyle Smith. And then also, just thought it was interesting, Iowa State playing South Dakota State at the end of that bracket. T.J. Otzelberger, of course, was a one-time South Dakota State head coach. And oh, by the way, on top of that, he uh, was at South Dakota State. He went to UNLV. Now he is at Iowa State. If you're just joining us, appreciate everybody's support. This is our Bracket Recap Thoughts show. And again, I promise you, we will have our full bracket picks. We'll do a Tuesday night show. If you have any questions, drop them into the comment section. I will get to them after. And again, do want to apologize for the sound, for the lighting. It was a debacle of a weekend in Vegas. Your boy Torres has to go to a Best Buy after I'm done with this. Get some tools to get this thing back on track. But uh, it's been a crazy couple days. Uh, four hours on our Fox Sports Radio Bracket Show. Now we're doing our Bracket Show here. Let's get to the West region. Okay, so this is your bottom left if you are, of course, looking at a bracket. Um, and I think there's a couple things that, that, that start here. First off, you know, th- there was some gripes about North Carolina being the final number one seed. I can't get too worked up about it. I think if you had asked me going into this past weekend, going into last week, I should say, I think Tennessee would have had the inside track as the number final number one. Then I would have put Arizona. Then I would have put Carolina. But Tennessee did not win a game at the SEC tournament. Uh, Carolina goes to the conference championship game. Arizona loses in the semis. And so Carolina wins two games. I have no fundamental issue with them being the number two seed. I do wonder if they wish they could be a little closer to home and be the be a two seed back east or in the south as opposed to being the one seed 3,000 miles from home when you could have to play Arizona in Los Angeles. And so when I look at that bracket, that's actually my number one takeaway. Listen, I, I've, I've rode the roller coaster with Arizona. I said after they beat uh, – I said in the, the, the early season, I said that's the best team in college basketball. Then there were ups and downs, peaks and valleys. We've talked about it. They lose at Stanford. They lose at Oregon State. They lose at USC. Last time I checked, none of those three teams are in the NCAA tournament or anywhere close. But when they play well, that is a team – that I believe can play with anybody. And what's interesting about Arizona, that West Regional is in Los Angeles. And so for them, if they can get to LA, if they can get to the Sweet 16, they will have a significant home court advantage over everybody else that they could potentially play. And with that, I kind of like the draw. I think Dayton, Nevada is going to be a great opening round game. Thursday, 4.30 Eastern time. That game is in Salt Lake, I believe. Dayton, if you haven't seen him, they got an NBA player, Deron Holmes. He's like a former top 30, top 40 prospect. 6'10", hits threes, buckets, gets rebounds, averages like 23 a game. Nevada actually has several interesting players. Jared Lucas, who, if you remember, was part of the Oregon State team that went to the Elite Eight during that COVID bubble year. Uh, one of the Blackshear brothers is really good. And then this kid, Nick Davidson, kind of a stretch five type kid. So I bring it up because I think that's going to be one of the great games. I think Arizona probably matches up a little bit better with Nevada or excuse me, with Dayton, but there's no excuse. Arizona should beat Long Beach State because Long Beach State has a fired head coach. We talked about it on radio. I mentioned it on Twitter. Dan Munson, the lost, the Long Beach State coach, remember, He was fired before the conference tournament. They let him coach the conference tournament. He ends up winning the whole darn thing. I said, it's like that line from Friday. How'd you get fired on your day off? Well, this is the exact opposite. You get fired, you keep showing up for work. Maybe it's like a little George Costanza thing. I didn't know I couldn't do that. But anyway, Arizona, there's no excuses. If you will have two very advantageous matchups, I would guess at minimum, you'll be like an eight to an eight and a half point favorite against either team that you would play in that round of 32. You have to win those games. And if you get to Los Angeles, I think there's a chance you could do some real damage there. Two other things about this region that stand out. The first one, um, that 4-5, four, five, five, that 4-13, 5-12 part of the bracket is fascinating to me. Alabama, the four seed playing Charleston, won this game is 3,000 miles from home. It's in Spokane, Washington. By the way, I thought the higher seed was supposed to have geographic advantage. They'll be playing St. Mary's, you know, probably an hour and a half plane ride from St. Mary's campus if they both advance. But with Alabama, I've said it. I think they've been overvalued all year long. 
I think Nate Oates has actually done a pretty good job to get them to this point. Charleston, second straight NCAA tournament. They were a play or two away from beating San Diego State last year. Wouldn't be stunned if they pull off the upset. Also, wouldn't be stunned if St. Mary's beats Grand Canyon or if Grand Canyon beats St. Mary's. Grand Canyon, Bryce Drew, head coach, multiple NCAA tournaments. And St. Mary's is one of those teams. They play super slow. It's almost like a Virginia. It's like Virginia falls down 8, 10 points with like nine minutes to go. They don't play a style that can overcome that. So that stands out to me. And then the other thing in the West, well, really two things. One, I think Mississippi State beats Michigan State. And I do think they could give Carolina fits. Don't think I'm ready to call for that upset yet. And the other thing, I think New Mexico is going to beat Clemson. And I don't even know that it is going to be considered to be an upset. Because if I saw them, the lines correctly on BetUS, and I could be mistaken on this, I believe that New Mexico is actually a slight favorite over the Clemson Tigers. New Mexico, by the way, it's worth noting, like New Mexico, they they won uh, that game on Saturday in the conference championship game. Maybe their best guard, Donovan Dent, had the flu and barely played. Whatever he got in Vegas, Torres got, but that's neither here nor there. Um, you know, I just bring it up because, yeah, according to BetUS, New Mexico is a one-and-a-half-point favorite. I just think they're the better team. I think they're going to win, and I think they actually match up pretty well with the Baylor Bears in the round of 32. So that could be a potential double-digit seed that's playing to the second weekend. I believe New Mexico as a program has never advanced to the round, to the Sweet 16, so that would be an incredible story. But again, we will have my picks for all four regions on Tuesday night. But New Mexico is one I feel very confident about that I will end up ultimately taking to do some real damage in that bracket. Let's keep it going. We'll get to the other two regions, and then I will get to all of your takes. For those of you who are joining on YouTube, appreciate your support. Make sure to subscribe to this channel. Uh, We're going to be doing all sorts of content. By the way, Portal is going to get crazy, and I'm here to promise you – well, nobody talks portal like we do. I mean, this channel has grown exponentially because of the portal. We'll do our first portal reaction on two, on Monday night. Saw a couple big names go in. Brandon Garrison from Oklahoma State is in. Uh, Stoyakovich, uh, Peja's son from Stanford, former McDonald's All-American is in. There's probably more since I started recording. So we will keep you updated uh, as things get going. Let's keep it going. Let's keep it going. Let's keep it going with some other stories, some other things that are going on. And let's go to that South region, uh, or excuse me, yeah, the South region, the upper right of your bracket, where Houston is the one seed, Marquette is the two, uh, the three seed is the University of Kentucky, and the four seed, of course, is Duke. A couple things, I keep saying it, Houston, watch the status of Juwan Roberts. He's kind of one of those toughness energy guys. And remember, Houston is a team that is down three guys right now from the start of the season that were in their rotation that are not playing. You lose him, you start to see how shorthanded this team was. He only played a few minutes against Iowa State. So that's a story to monitor. He did play against Iowa State. You wonder if he'll be available. I also think it's worth noting uh, Texas Tech. I would argue of their three most important players, two did not play in their most recent Big 12 championship game. Darion Williams, who's like a big guard, 6'5", 6'6", can kind of defend multiple positions. He did not play, but he is expected back. Warren Washington, to me, is the X factor. 7'1", 7'2", just a big 7-footer, fifth-year guy. And I bring it up because that is the kind of guy, you start to look at a round of 32, where's Kentucky's weakness in the paint? Do they have guys that can consistently get them buckets? You need... You know, if you're Texas Tech, you're going to need Warren Washington. But if you have them, you could give Kentucky fits. A couple things stand out about this region. Let's start. I mean, oh, by the way, Tyler Kolick from Marquette, that goes without saying. I think the thing that stands out, you know, Kentucky, we talk enough about him. We know a lot about Calipari. We know what's at stake. He's not getting fired if he loses in this tournament. But, you know, you haven't been to a, a you haven't been to the second weekend since 2019. And I know 2020, you were good enough to win a national championship with Tyrese Maxey, Emmanuel Quickly, and all that. But you have not been to a to the second weekend since 2019. You have not been to a Final Four since 2015. And I think all things considered, this bracket lays out pretty well for you. And with Kentucky, I'll say it's tough to evaluate them. Because on the one hand, you can't unsee 
what you saw against Texas A&M on Friday. And I think more than just the defensive woes, they just didn't show up ready to play. And you cannot do that when you have thousands of fans paying their hard-earned money to come see you play in Nashville. You can't just have a no-show. You cannot. And so I solely bring it up because you can't unsee that. But I also don't want to dismiss what this team did over the last five weeks when they won at Tennessee, when they won at Auburn, when they beat Alabama, when they beat Ole Miss, when they beat uh, uh, Mississippi State on the road. I mean, those three wins, just think about that. At Auburn, at Mississippi State, at Tennessee. You win those three games. You can beat anybody in college basketball on a neutral court. And I do think, especially if Texas Tech is not healthy, this bracket lines up nicely for you. You have to get to the Sweet 16. And when you get to the Sweet 16, you know, you've beaten Florida. You're playing a Marquette team that's not 100%. That's a game that you should be competitive in. Now, you get to Houston, that's a different conversation. A couple other thoughts on this bracket. One, Marquette. Are they healthy? I don't know. And Marquette's another one I'm a little torn on. Because when I look at Marquette, what stands out to me is that on the one hand, they made the Big East Championship game without their star guard, Tyler Kolick, okay? Credit to them, that was an impressive run. But when you really break it down, they got to the Big East Championship game. They got destroyed by UConn, even though it was close for about 20, you know, 23, 24, 25 minutes. They also needed overtime against Villanova. They also had to pull away late against the Providence team that was beat up, down guys, third game and third night, short bench, whatever. So are they really that improved? Are they really that good? Or could they have lost in their opener of the Big East tournament, not even made it to Friday, let alone Saturday? Florida, we all saw that gruesome injury from their center, Micah Hanlogton. I'll be curious to see how that how they handle that. He was a, an important part. I wouldn't say he was the be-all, end-all, because he was a guy, like he was a starter, but he didn't necessarily play a ton of, of minutes. And so I just bring it up because, um, you know, you look at that injury, on the one hand, it could just be one where – Florida doesn't recover from that. On the other hand, he was playing about 19 minutes per game. Tyree Samuel played a lot at that five spot. They play a lot of four out guards. And so I just, I don't know what to expect from them in that spot. Uh, Beyond that, I'm trying to think of what else stands out. I'll tell you what stands out. I got an upset for you. I got an upset that I truly believe in my heart of hearts. I truly believe, I think Vermont's beaten Duke. And I've, I've been out on Duke for weeks now. And I'll tell you, I was in on Duke. And when you just, it's not even competitive against Carolina at home. And then you really start to break down their resume. We talked about it. Think about Duke's resume right now. Lose to Arizona in the non-con. Okay, that's no problem. Lose at Arkansas in the non-con. Lose at Georgia Tech, which was your ACC opener. Then you get to ACC play. You do have a nice win over Baylor, but you get to ACC play. The ACC, apparently to everyone except for the tournament committee, was really down this year. Clemson is an at-large team. You beat them by two at home and need the ref's help. You get swept by Carolina. And so you start to look at the Duke resume. You start to peel it back, and you know what you see? You see a team that, if we're being honest, there's really not that much there. There's a win against Baylor. That's a good win on a neutral where you had the decided fan advantage. And there's a great win, or there's a win against Michigan State that most of us don't even think should be in the tournament. Now, you want to talk NC State? Okay, they're in the tournament. They, they had to win five games in five days, whatever. I just bring it up because it's hard for me to get excited about this Duke team. And I'll say this. Duke doesn't have very much size, and the way to beat Duke, you limit the three-point shooting. What does Vermont do well? Vermont takes away the three-point shot. Top 50 nationally in three-point shooting. I'm calling it now. That is an upset. Let's go ahead and wrap with the final bracket. By the way, please drop your questions. Uh, We will have our official picks on Tuesday night. Make sure you are subscribed on YouTube. We'll go live on Tuesday to react to that. Uh, But let's go ahead and and wrap this uh, show. And uh, by the way, I will answer your questions at the end. But to me, the Midwest is very interesting for this reason. Okay, Midwest, top four seeds, Purdue's number one. Everybody knows Torres loves Purdue. The number two seed, this is your lower left-hand bracket, by the way, is Tennessee. The three seed is Creighton. The four seed is Kansas. So a few things stand out. I'm just going to be blunt. I know it's the trendy upset. I think Kansas is losing in round one. So if you've never seen Sanford, what they do, 
They speed you up. They're a top 10 team in the country in scoring. They are a top 10 team in the country in field goals forced or, or turnovers forced, excuse me, okay? So if you remember like the old school Rick Patino teams, the Nolan Richardson 40 minutes of hell, that's basically what they do. They're not very big, but they run you up and down. They force you into a quick game. They force a lot of turnovers. And this Kansas team doesn't have bodies. We don't know the health of Kevin McCullough, of Hunter Dickinson, but this is one of those games where I just think it's a bad matchup for them, even if this guy plays, even if even if those guys play. So I think that upset is coming. And I'm here to tell you, McNeese Gonzaga, by the way, quick shout out to my buddy, Brandon Chambers. Uh, he is a uh, assistant coach at McNeese under Will Wade. Will Wade shouted him out in the press conference, the post, the, 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 the bracket press conference, because Brandon Chambers was kind of doing some research on who he thought potential first round matchups could be. He said, I think we're getting Gonzaga as a five seed. And I don't know if he got the exact region right, but but Will Wade tweeted it out. Brandon Chambers tweeted it out. Their team accounts tweeted it out. But it was it was crazy because the Joe Lenardis of the world, none of them had McNe- none of them had Gonzaga as a five, but McNeese gets them. And I'll tell you this, you know, McNeese, top 10 defense in pretty much every single category. That is a team that, in my opinion, can absolutely pull off an upset. And it would not stun me to see a Sanford McNeese game. By the way, Will Wade mentioned this on the show last week. Remember, Sanford's coach, Bucky McMillan, is a legendary. He's a young guy. He's about 40, 41. But he won like five state titles as a high school head coach in Birmingham. He actually coached Trendon Watford, who played for Will Wade at LSU. So I bring that up because those two coaches have ties. Be cool to see one of them to the Sweet 16. I could also see, by the way, in the 6-11 matchup, a potential upset. South Carolina's the 6, Oregon's the 11. Oregon, for you OG fans of uh, really Kentucky, their star player in Folly Dante, remember him? He was a player who reclassified, came down to Oregon and Kentucky. He chooses Oregon. He's now a fifth-year senior at Oregon, dominated the Pac-12 tournament. And I don't know that that South Carolina, they play great defense, but I don't know that they have an answer for him down low. And Oregon's a very big team. And so this is a region. I could see the 11 seed winning, the 12 seed winning, the 13 seed winning, which brings me to this. Purdue and Tennessee, I would argue, along with Arizona, are the three teams that right now kind of have the reputation. They just don't get it done in March. I think all three have very advantageous draws. Let's. We talked about Arizona, obviously. You look at Purdue. Listen, I've been critical of Purdue. That game against Wisconsin was an abomination. But to beat Purdue, this is what I believe you need. You need a lot of big bodies to throw at Zach Eady. You're never going to hold him to 10 and 5. Like, that's just not going to happen. But can you hold him to 18 and 12? And I don't know that anyone in this region has enough big bodies to do that. Creighton has one seven-footer, Ryan Kalkbrenner. They play mostly guards besides that. South Carolina doesn't have that personnel. I don't think Stanford, or I don't think uh, Kansas is getting that far, but they don't. Gonzaga played Purdue earlier in the season. It wasn't even close. I don't think they do. And so you start to look at who Purdue could potentially play. I don't think it's going to be, it's not a tough draw. By the way, round two, you get Utah State. Utah State's uh, center, guy named Great Osibor is like six foot nine. Zach Eady going to have a six-inch height advantage on him. So you have to have bodies to throw at Zach Eady, and you have to have big guards to limit Purdue's guards. And I don't know that any of these teams have it. And so I look at this region. I only see one team that can really beat Purdue, and that's the Tennessee Volunteers. And Tennessee, it's kind of the same. One, the irony of having to play St. Peter's, uh, yeah, that's hysterical. Of course, St. Peter's, we know what they did the last time they were 15 seed beating Kentucky in round one. Of course, they also beat Purdue in the Sweet 16. But Tennessee, you get that team, then you get probably Texas. There is no reason Tennessee should not be in the Sweet 16. Then you get to the Sweet 16, you know, Creighton, I think, could be an interesting matchup for them. But I think you're you're looking at Purdue. I don't see anybody that can beat them in that region. I think we're probably getting a Purdue-Tennessee Elite Eight. If Tennessee's not there, I don't think there's anyone from the bottom half of that bracket that beats Purdue. And so, listen, I've been number one Purdue critic from the beginning. I like their draw a lot. 
And sometimes that's how it goes. Sometimes you just get the right breaks at the right time. And in that moment, you know, maybe it's a situation where Purdue needs, Purdue gets a couple breaks and all of a sudden they're in Phoenix playing in a final four. All right. So those are my bracket. That's really my bracket breakdown. Uh, really good stuff there. A uh, couple things here. One, I will tell you that later this evening, I will come back. We will do some, some uh, transfer portal stuff over these next couple weeks, over these next couple hours. Um, really, so basically, make sure you're subscribed on YouTube. We will do a portal reaction to uh, Monday, the opening day of the portal, probably about 8 p.m. Eastern time. So make sure you're subscribed. Put on those notifications. We'll react to all of it. Uh, also, we'll have a regular interview with Hassan Diara. Tuesday night, I will be making my NCAA tournament picks. So make sure to tune in. Let me see really quickly if we have a couple questions before I get out of here. Uh, yes, it was a grind in Vegas, but I'm so happy to be home. We will get the lighting thing fixed. We will get the sound thing fixed. Appreciate your support. All right, let's get to a couple questions or comments here. Paul says, I thought what happens in Vegas stays in Vegas. Uh, yeah, Paul, I'm not here to talk about that. Uh, but no, uh, Vegas was fun. But I bring it up because um, – when I look at what happened in Vegas, I sit there and say, uh, yeah, wasn't that bad. Uh, Mike Luke, my buddy from Arizona, got me sick. Uh, no comment on that. Three Big East teams is a joke, says Christopher. He's right. Faith says, I cannot in good consciousness root for Southern Cal, UCLA, Syracuse, or Loyola Marymount because of my family lineage. I went to community college. little confused on that one, but that's okay. Uh, John Hume says, go big blue. I agree. Paul says, any take on the top teams turning down the NIT? Um, top teams turning down the NIT. All I will say is I actually see both sides. To me, I actually thought Tom Crean, and I think a lot of you would agree, I thought his take on that whole situation was, was actually very interesting. I also think, listen, we've devalued everything other than the NCAA tournament. And more than that, while we have – the portal going on at the same time as the college basketball postseason, guess what happens? You're going to have coaching staffs that basically say, listen, my guys don't want to play in this. We thought we were going to be in the NCAA tournament, and I got to start building my roster for next year. And it's actually advantageous to not play in the NIT because you can fully focus fully on the portal. You can focus fully on processing your roster, who's staying, who's going, and then you can also figure out, okay, what am I doing and who are we pursuing in the portal? By the way, I remember this was an issue last year. I remember LSU of all teams, Matt McMahon, who I like. He had like, you know, they were doing home visits and official visits as everybody was getting ready for the first weekend of the NCAA tournament. Everyone's like, wait a second now. He, he finished last in the SEC and he gets the advantage of talking to all the best players first and going in home. So this is the system we've set up. I don't really blame the NCA because every time the NCA tries to change something, the lawyers get involved. And I think kids want to figure out where they're going. I think they want the portal open early. And I don't think it's going to change until all of college sports changes. So I get the point. I wish there was something different. But I also thought Tom Crean's point was actually pretty good. A uh, couple bear downs. We got some Arizona fans in here. Um, but I'll tell you what, I think that's it. We've done an hour here. Uh, we've been live for just about an hour now. Uh, I do think it is time for me to get out of here. Appreciate everybody tuning in. A couple things. Again, final time, we will have a portal segment later this evening. Cannot wait to talk portal. I told the buddy, the portal is kind of my favorite thing to cover. And so we're going to have portal reaction here uh, probably about 8 p.m. Eastern time. Make sure you're locked in. But other than that, I think that's about it. If you're not subscribed to the show, please make sure to do so. Apple, Spotify, Amazon Music. Also, make sure you're subscribed on, uh, on YouTube. Click those notifications because we are going to be going live, all sorts of stuff, all sorts of portal, NCAA tournament, whatever. Again, Tuesday night, we will have my official bracket picks that will probably be going on during some of those late games. And really, that's it. Uh, thank you to BetUS. BetUS, 125% uh, deposit bonus on your first three deposits. Bracketfanatics.com will get you the full details on the Aaron Torres Pod Bracket Challenge here uh, in just a little bit. But we will have a $1,000 prize pool, so we appreciate your support there. I'm going to get out of here. We will be doing more Portal Talk later in the day, but it is time for me to go. Shout out to Torrent Craig. Shout out to Rachel, who hates my voice. 
Shout out to JJ Reddick, you FN Unblock Me. By the way, I see JJ Reddick is trending on Twitter. Wonder what that's about. We'll be back later this evening to talk Portal. And then other than that, it's go time. We're making picks on 